Welcome to the Irreplaceable Dental Assistant Podcast brought to you by Dane, dental assisting made easy. This is a safe space to be mentored, empowered, energized, and equipped. Welcome to another episode of the Irreplaceable Dental Assistant, brought to you by Dane Dental Assisting Made Easy. Today, I have a wonderful surprise for you. A guest um, he, who is a clinical psychologist and who works specifically with a, a category of people that we don't normally think about in the dental office, but I'm going to give Dr. Jarrell Myers, my guest, an opportunity to share a little bit about himself and then we'll delve into his area of expertise and what he can share with us as we seek to provide the best possible care for our clients in the dental office. Welcome Dr. Myers. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Jarrell Myers. I am a clinical psychologist currently working in the New York area. I work at a clinic called the Center for Motivation and Change. And the specialty for that clinic is in working with people who struggle with substance use disorders. So people who are abusing or dependent on substances for varying reasons. Um, as you can imagine, the folks that come into our office will be using substances. However, there are multiple reasons why people use substances. And our goal is not just to focus on the substance use, but also the underlying reasons for their substance use. In the world in which we currently live, people are struggling with a lot and do not necessarily have the coping skills to deal with everything that we are being asked to manage, especially in an environment where we've had to be isolated and we've had to social distance and not interact with people and do the, the types of things that we're accustomed to doing. People are struggling. So the goal of the work that I do is to help people who are struggling. Substance use is one of my uh, areas of expertise. In addition to that, I work with people who struggle with mood disorders, so anxiety, depression, as well as uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, or different types of trauma. Um, and I've uh, cut my teeth on working with people who are adolescents and children. Right now I'm working with older adolescents into young adulthood primarily, um, but that's, that's who I am and what I do. Wow, oh, that's a lot. Thank you for sharing. Uh, what is What I find interesting is we don't necessarily think of people struggling with substance abuse as trying to cope. We just think that maybe they've made bad decisions and ended up in a situation that has over overtaken them. So it's, it's good for you to highlight that point that sometimes people are just trying to cope and they grasp at whatever they can catch to help them do that. Absolutely. Uh, as humans, we engage in any behavior because we're getting something out of it. Most people will look at people who use substances and see it having really negative consequences for those individuals' lives as them just looking to get high or drunk or intoxicated or whatever the case may be. However, I think that if we were to take a look at why they wanted to get high, what they were looking to escape from, what they were looking to get away from, it gives us better insight into what may be going on for that individual and how we can be helpful to them. In today's culture and in substance use culture in general, we are only looking at what I believe is a symptom as opposed to the underlying issues. So we downplay whatever else may be occurring and are just looking at the overt behavior. We're looking at the fact that somebody is 
drinking all the time or smoking all the time or snorting all the time or injecting things into their bodies all the time, but not the reason why. And that is, if we want someone to change, that is what we have to address. Wow. That, that is, that alone, I think could be a discussion that could be picked apart for hours on end because so many of us are looking at it from the perspective of um, disciplining somebody who is doing something wrong rather than looking at the perspective of it. This is someone who is in trouble, who may be in crisis mode, and they're trying to cope. Now layer onto that everyday experiences like going to the dentist, which on the normal circumstances can make average stable people feel a little anxiety. Um, we have dental assistants who will prepare the patients for the dentist usually escorting them into the clinical area and taking vital signs and having discussions with them before treatment begins. Do you have any um, suggestions as to how the team should, um, should approach someone to maybe first determine what are the signs of substance abuse and then if we have determined or suspect that there may be substance abuse, do's and don'ts. I think firstly, we have to understand that going to the dentist, as much as it is a normal experience, if everything is going well, it happens once every six months, so at best twice a year, that's not that regular. So dental assistants may see, dental offices in general may see many people coming in and out of their doors and they may be accustomed to the experience but people in general aren't necessarily accustomed to the experience in addition to that when you're looking at the material that dentists hygienists dental assistants are using they're not material that we're accustomed to seeing they are sharp objects they make very loud noises um, they're in an area that feels extra sensitive to humans so we're working in the mouth so it feels very uncomfortable. It feels very vulnerable. So you're absolutely right. For the average person who may be coming into the dental office, they may feel a little bit of anxiety unless they've just become accustomed to the experience. They may feel a little bit of anxiety uh, or discomfort around going into the office and having to have a routine procedure like a cleaning done, much less uh, having a cavity filled or a root canal or a bridge, um, things like that. So I think the expectation should be that everyone that is walking through the door is feeling a bit uncomfortable. Now, if we can agree that that may be the case, then we can assume that there are going to be people out there who are going to be looking for ways to relieve some of that discomfort and distress that they may be experiencing. There are people who are able to use substances recreationally and it doesn't really affect their functioning. It doesn't affect the way that they're living their lives. But there are also some people who don't use it effectively, don't use it recreationally and use it as a coping skill or a coping mechanism. And what I mean by that is it helps them to relieve the distress that they may be experiencing. So if someone were to come into my office, I would evaluate with them the things that are making them feel uncomfortable and we'd come up with alternative skills for helping them to manage that discomfort whether that is distracting themselves taking deep breaths doing things to prepare themselves for the experience at the dentist but for someone who may be addicted or dependent on substances there's nothing that has that short-term effect that i've come across then than what uh, substances provide to them. So there, there could be an assumption that there are people coming into the office who may use substances as a way of calming themselves down. When someone is coming into the office intoxicated, you're looking for the typical signs, of course, the, the most out, um, uh, overt signs. So uh, if they smoke, having red eyes, if they have had multiple drinks of alcohol, 
that their speech may be slurred or they may be staggering. Um, they may have difficulty focusing on the things that you are saying. Uh, they may have some, some amount of difficulty with just with the overall experience. So you're looking not just for the level of discomfort that someone is feeling, because with someone who's having anxiety may have difficulty concentrating, but more so you're looking for changes in behaviors that don't seem normal to you, that don't seem the way that things should be, that the way that they typically are with patients who may be coming into the office. That's first and foremost. Anything that feels out of the ordinary or sees, seems like it's out of the ordinary should raise your antenna. You should be looking for that type of thing. If someone has used a substance, then I, I'm assuming with the policies of the dental office, you're probably not going to see them uh, because they because it may affect their body chemistry, affect the way that they may be able to experience the treatment, um, whether or not their mouth is ready to be worked on. So that makes sense. But in terms of what you do long term, I think it's about the experience that you create in the dental office. So even if people are feeling anxious or are concerned or worried about the procedures that may be taking place, I think explaining to them what's going to be going on, having them take a few moments, whether it's take a deep breath and calm themselves down or focus their attention elsewhere or help them to focus their attention elsewhere so that the dentist and the hygienist can do what they need to do. I think those are important things. Um, if I'm being 100% honest, it may be quite difficult for you to, to work with someone who's using a substance in the office, but my plea would be to try to be understanding as to why that may be occurring as opposed to initially passing judgment on them for using a substance. Yeah, that I think that's the point that's being driven home to me today, which is to be more understanding than judgmental. And you are correct. We would not want to treat someone who has, um, who's high, who has some substance in their bodies, but um, would you suggest in between visits, having conversations to check in and see how they're doing with their oral hygiene or, you know, letting them know what the next visit will entail and, you know, trying to make sure that they know as much as possible so they aren't as apprehensive? Absolutely. I think the more information we have, the better it can be because with anxiety, our minds tend to create experiences where we catastrophize, where we think of the worst case scenario, or if we're unable to create whatever that worst case scenario is in our minds, we, we just know that we, we assume that it's going to be negative, that it's going to be bad. So it makes us want to avoid that experience as much as possible. I think that with more information, people are able to come to terms with what to expect. In addition to that, if I have more contact with the people who I would be working with in a dental office, uh, where they might be checking in on that dental hygiene, where they may be reaching out just to answer any questions or explain what may be happening for the upcoming procedure, if there's bandwidth for that within that dental practice, I think that's a great practice to have just so people are more accustomed to and more aware of what it's going to be like when they go into that office. And as I said uh, earlier, if there can be some sort of practice for the assisting team to help people who may be struggling with anxiety about going to the dentist just to help them become more accustomed to it, I think that's a positive procedure to engage in as well. The more comfortable that we can make it for people, knowing that at some points in time, have going into the dentist can be very uncomfortable. The more comfortable, the more aware we can make people of what that experience will be like, I think the better the outcome overall. You've truly opened our eyes today, Dr. Myers. I have another question for you. Do you think that time of day is important in setting the appointment? Meaning when I'm treating young children, I prefer to see them early in the day before they get tired and frustrated at the end of the day and they tend to be less willing to be compliant, um, less cooperative. Uh, would time of day or any particular thing about the 
appointment be important as we look at setting an appointment with somebody who may be challenged with anxiety or drug abuse or you know things of that nature yeah absolutely i do think so so when so as human beings we have what are called vulnerability factors meaning that whenever we walk into a situation or an experience we're not walking in as complete blank slates we're taking into that experience our past history being in that place or assumptions that we may have based on our past history and being in that place but also things like whether or not we've had something to eat for the day or whether or not we've gotten enough sleep the night before etc so I do think that time of day can play a role because you're more likely to have more vulnerability factors later in the day because you've had much more of the day to experience as opposed to earlier in the morning where you may be a bit more rested, you may have more resources to deal with the stress that's associated with being in the dental office. So that can be helpful, especially for anxious patients. For people who may use substances, I don't know that it makes that much of a difference because you can... You can use at any point in time and get the the desired benefits fairly quickly that you're looking to get. However, I do think that having that contact that we spoke about before can be helpful, especially for people who may be coming into your office who you know may have more of a vulnerability to feeling anxious and or to using a substance because then there can be that reminder about not using a substance prior to the session. You're answering the questions, you're providing more information. You have a point of contact at the office that makes it feel a little bit more comfortable for you to be there, that perhaps can walk you through uh, the office and stay with you through the procedure, et cetera. Okay, that sounds great. I have another question. Are there things that we could do in the dental office to create more calm for example would it be helpful to ask them to perhaps bring their favorite playlist and listen to something uh, with their earbuds um, would the noises in the dental office affect should we ensure that maybe that person is seen by themselves and nobody else at that time to lessen the chances of other sounds coming from other treatment rooms I, I'm, I'm really in the dark, so I'm asking. Yeah, I do think, so I, I spoke earlier about coping skills, the things that people coming into my office could do to help them deal with distress. I do think that having things like music or watching videos, things that'll help to distract you while you're in the waiting room, as your as the anticipation is building about being called to the back i do think those things can be extremely helpful for dealing with the the distress the anxiety in those moments i think when you get back to the office if you can allow a patient to continue listening to music i think that would be a great thing um i also think uh so these aren't necessarily skills that a dental assistant might have but if if i could pass one on uh, people, when they're feeling anxious, get stuck in their minds. They're always anticipating, their bodies become tense. They they have a hard time uh, dealing with that. And while in the chair, there's not a, really an opportunity for them to move about, to shake it off, to stretch or anything like that, because the dentist is working in a very small area. They're using small sharp tools so a lot of damage can be done if they're moving around but if there are ways that a person can ground themselves or a dental assistant can help someone ground themselves and what i mean by that is orienting them to where they are right now using their senses so asking them what the chair feels like asking them if, if you're holding their hand i guess prior to covid but if you were holding their hand how tight it feels how, how tight they notice uh, the feeling of the squeezing of their hand or uh, how loud the music may be. Just sort of orienting them to what's going on around them as opposed to the anticipation that they're having in the room. Um, and if if time allows, moving at the pace for that individual, the, the pace that that individual can take. Um, I do think that setting milestones for a person can be helpful. So if the dentist or the dental assistant know that they're going to be doing a cleaning and they know that they have someone extra anxious in the chair or, 
um, or someone who has used in the past in the chair, telling them what you're going to be doing. So I'm going to be taking out the floss and I'm going to be flossing your teeth. You may experience a little bit of discomfort. Let me know. We can take a pause for a moment and you let me know when you're ready to get back going. Or I'm going to be using the suction in your mouth. It's going to be there for the majority of the time. Um, it's not doing anything. The only reason it's making noise is because it's constantly sucking out the moisture in your mouth so that I can work effectively in there. I think, again, the more information that people have, the more that they can do with it. Otherwise, for, especially for someone who's anxious, they're making up things in their mind and it makes it more of an uncomfortable experience for them. Okay, that sounds great. I have one more um, question or comment. A lot of times when I have anxious patients, I kind of give them a little bit of control in the sense that I will tell them if for any reason they need me to stop, they can signal me and I'll give them what that signal is. Usually it's them lifting the hand that is further away from me where I'm working. And um, it kind of gives them the freedom to say, okay, if this starts to go south, <laughs> I have some control to stop, to pause, to notify um, them that something is going wrong. Do you think that that's a, a good thing to, to provide or to share with the patient? Absolutely, absolutely. Having a sense of control over that, I think, gives them the ability to pause things for a moment and collect themselves. I think that is a good thing if it happens in addition to them doing something to help calm themselves down or prepare for whatever is is next going to happen. So whether perhaps that could be an area where dental assistants could jump in um, and provide some some coping skills, whether it's deep breaths um, or again, that grounding technique um, or just encouraging them to, to kind of maybe stretch and relax, whatever the case may be, but doing something that helps them to relax just for a moment so that they can prepare themselves for whatever is going to happen next. Well, Dr. Myers, I have to tell you, this has really been an eye-opening session. You have shared so much, primarily the fact that we really ought not to be judgmental. We need to be patient. We need to make sure that the patient has as much information up front and that may require touching bases with them in between appointments so that they don't as you have said get too much in their head but but we can bring them to the present by asking them questions about what's happening in the environment what's happening with the chair things that they're seeing things that they're hearing how loud or how soft they are giving them the control to stop, to pause, letting them know what a signal can be beforehand. And just in general, recognizing that some people just need a little more time, a little more care, and we need to be mindful of that. Did I summarize what you um, said in its entirety? Did I leave anything out? No, I, I think that covers what I was hoping to, to portray today. So yes, it was a great summary. Okay, so at the end of each session, I try to leave a quote and I thought of this one that I'm going to share with you today as we end. Never judge someone without knowing the whole story. You may think you understand, but you don't. <laughs> I'm going That's to say that again, just for all of us, right? Never judge someone without knowing the whole story. You may think you understand, but you don't. Dr. Myers, thank you so much for opening our eyes today. Um, if someone wanted to reach out to you, is there some way that they could contact you? Sure. Uh, so my primary email address is jarellmyersphd at gmail.com. That is spelled J-A-R-E-L-L. -L. M Y E R S P H D at gmail.com. So if someone wanted to reach out to me, that would be the best way I think for, for folks to, to contact me. Um, and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. Thank you so much for your time. God bless. Thank you. Take care. I must tell you that 
every time I leave one of these sessions, I end up saying, wow, that was awesome. <laughs> well, this week is no different. I think that there were so many pearls shared by Dr. Myers. And um, we're just so grateful to have been um, blessed to have so many knowledgeable guests so far. So Dr. Myers um, is a psychologist, a clinical psychologist at the Center for Motivation and Change. And he can be contacted at the email Jarrell Myers PhD at gmail.com J A R E L L M Y E R S P H D at gmail.com. Once again, we have proof that as we learn, as we grow, as we sharpen our swords, we can definitely. Uh, be more confident in sharing and serving our clients in being a really, really motivated, um, encouraging team member to the other members of our team who may be a little intimidated about certain things. You know, creating systems, understanding what you're going to do before things happen makes life so much stressful because if something happens and you already have a plan, you know what? You just flow with the plan. <laughs> if something catches you off guard, it can be extremely stressful. So the more you tune in to this podcast and the more we talk about things that can happen and possibilities and what to do and how to prepare, the more beneficial you are going to be to your doctor, to your team, and most importantly, to your patients. Remember, we are better together. See you the next time. <laughs>